Hey everybody, welcome to Wizard School. This is the series where I break down the fundamentals of eternal magic. And this is episode three, and today we're talking about Wasteland. The Legacy card pool contains magic's most powerful threats, which is fine because it also contains a variety of magic's most powerful answers. Nothing is truly unbeatable in Legacy. Nobody wants to play in a format where every game is lost on turn one and determined by the die roll. The powerful answers available in Legacy are frequently called the glue of the format, meaning that they keep it from falling apart. In today's video, we're going to discuss one of the glues of Legacy, and that's Wasteland. So let's look at this card real quick. It's a land itself, so it costs no mana and doesn't use the stack to enter the battlefield. Unlike some lands from Magic's history, it does tap for mana, and it can be sacrificed to destroy a non-basic land. Pretty simple stuff, right? So we have free, uncounterable land destruction. Not so fast. It's not really free. It doesn't cost mana, but it does cost you a mana producing land. So it, this is pretty far from free. It costs you your land drop for the turn and sets you back a mana for the rest of the game. So in order to play Wasteland, its effect has to be worth losing a land over. These are my super official psychographics of Wasteland players that I'm gonna use for the purposes of this conversation. I made all these up. No one's going to know what you're talking about if you use these names, but I think it'll help us frame this. So first there's the fun police, there's the scrapper, the crusher, and the surgeon. So the fun police, the fetch land dual land mana base in legacy provides near perfect access to colorless mana. We've talked about this in previous videos. It's pretty messed up that that one polluted delta can get all of these lands and more out of your deck. Wasteland keeps Legacy from becoming five color piles of all the best spells in Magic. And it does that by helping to preserve the precious color pie as ordained by Dr. Garfield himself, literally in Magic as Richard Garfield intended. So the fun police decks tend to be one or two colors. Restricting the number of colors in your deck increases consistency, but also restricts what cards you can play. Decks with three or more colors will have access to more powerful options. That's the color pie at work. Denying them a color and or a raw amount of mana will deny them their more powerful spells. These decks tend to jump ahead on mana using effects like Noble Hierarch and other mana creatures or Aether Vile. Some examples of these decks are Death and Taxes and Maverick. Next is the Scrapper. The Scrapper wants to play a small game. They want to win the game with one and two mana spells while making sure the opponent never resolves anything big. They're not trying to grind the opponent into dust, just pull them down into the mud long enough to deal 20 damage. So let's look at this board state I constructed here. We have a Delver deck playing against a blue-white control deck. Both players have low resources. Delver's got one land, the control deck's got two. The control deck's taking some heavy beatdowns. Uh, if they cast that Snapcaster Mage, it's getting spell snared. Even if they draw the land for the Council's Judgment, it's getting spell pierced. If they try to protect anything with Force of Will, that'll get dazed. And they can cast all these cards on just one land. But notice that they have to be clocking, they have to be attacking, they have to be trying to get the game over with. Because if this control player just draws two more lands and casts that Supreme Verdict, there's going to be trouble for the Scrapper. So they're trying to get over the finish line, they don't have forever to do it. So... Their deck was built specifically to play a low resource game. All their spells cause zero, one, or two mana. They can afford to lose lands because it will always be a worse exchange for the opponent. Some examples of this type of deck are any Delver deck, Eldrazi, Merfolk, Goblins. And these decks, they're not content to just destroy your lands. They want to squeeze you from other directions using the, the other spells in their deck. So. Cards like Spell Pierce and Daze make it harder to resolve threats when your mana is also under attack. Thalia and Thorn of Amethyst, they make your spells cost more. Plus, your lands are getting destroyed, you may never cast a spell. Chalice of the Void, like maybe you can pay three mana to cast your one mana spell, but it's still going to get countered. Like, they really squeeze you. The next one is the Crusher. Crusher decks want their opponent to have nothing left at the end of the game, a flawless victory. They create ways to pull ahead on resources as they push their opponents backwards on theirs. Games with these sorts of decks can last a very long time, and if you're dead, you're dead, concede. If you're out of lands, feel free to save time, go to the next one. So Crushers build their deck specifically to abuse Wasteland. 
Some jump ahead on mana or play more than one land per turn. Some recoup lost cards or to pull ahead over time. All of them have ways to replay Wasteland over and over again. Examples of these sort of decks are like lands, four color loam, pox, and stacks. And the last one we're going to talk about is the Surgeon. They want clean answers to a variety of threats. Rather than stopping opponents from gathering resources, like all our other Wasteland decks, they try to stop them from cashing in. They want to stop the one payoff point rather than try to constrict everything that leads to that point. Sometimes the payoff is a land. Lands are difficult to interact with with spells, so Wasteland can fill that role. So Surgeons build their decks to answer opposing threats. Counter spells, discard, and removal spells can cover most threats opponents can muster. Lands can't be countered, they usually can't be discarded, and they're difficult to remove from play. If everything else is under control, it's much better to lose a land than to lose the game. We can all agree with that. Losing the game is pretty much the worst thing you can do in Magic. So destroying a land is only for emergencies. Surgeons usually just have Wasteland for mana. And since it's for special occasions, Surgeons tend to play less than four Wasteland. It's just a tool, it's not their plan. Some examples of these sort of decks, uh, Stoneblade, Grixis Control, and Slow Depths. All of those play between zero and three Wastelands, depending on their current build and the current metagame. All right, so Wasteland serves a specific purpose in, in the decks that it's in. It could be to deny options, to push a tempo advantage, actually grind an opponent into dust, or just to answer specific problems. And not every deck wants Wasteland. Combo decks don't care about enemy lands, they're busy just winning. And true control decks usually can't afford to throw a land away, so they control opposing lands with other sorts of methods. So Wasteland is a versatile tool that a variety of decks use in different ways. It forces deck building decisions for everyone, whether you're building with it or building to play against it, and it's an essential pillar of keeping legacy healthy. So now that we know what Wasteland does and what kind of decks it goes in, let's talk about some tips, tricks, and clever interactions to maximize your Wasteland experience. So when's the right time to use your Wasteland? That's pretty much the same as every other thing in Magic. You want to do it when you have the most information to know what to do with it. So there's usually no reason to do it in an opponent's end step. So let's look over here. We got Wasteland. We're in the end step. We just fire off this Wasteland in the end step because we can. Then we get around to our draw step and whoops, we drew a three drop that we can't cast. We probably didn't even care about that Tundra because you can't kill True Name Nemesis with Swords to Plowshares. So we messed up. There was no reason to do that. Waiting for your own draw step is what offers the most information. So here's the structure of a magic turn. You'll notice that the draw step has its own window to play effects. After you untap, and then you do your upkeep effects, then there's a window where you draw your card, you see what you, you're going to have for the turn, and then you can play instance or activate instant speed abilities. And the reason to use your wasteland here is that mana empties after each step and phase. So if you destroy a land in your draw step and your opponent floats mana, that mana will be gone for your main phase when you want to start casting spells. So let's take another look at that. This time we didn't shoot it off at the end step. We draw for turn, it's Tarmogoyf. We have two mana to cast this Goyf. We don't want this Goyf to get Swords to Plow shared right away. So in the draw step, we pick off that Tundra, then move to our main phase where we can cast Goyf unimpeded. So there wouldn't be much of a Wasteland video if we didn't talk about the most threatening lands in Legacy. The Stage Depths combo is a major player in the metagame. It's in a bunch of different shells, it's very powerful. The combo works by copying Dark Depths with Despian Stage. Once it's copied, you'll have two Dark Depths. You'll have the original with Ice Counters on it, and the copy with no Ice Counters on it. The Legend Rule will eat one of them. You sacrifice the original, you keep the copy, and you're left with a Dark Depths that has no counters on it, which will trigger and make Merit Lage. You can make a 2020 flying indestructible creature at instant speed on turn four without ever casting a spell. That's serious business. So how do you stop this from happening? All the combo needs is land drops. Lands can't be disrupted by counters or discard. And to beat Merit Lage, you'll need to remove an indestructible 2020 at instant speed or destroy the lands that make it before it arrives. 
if only we had some cheap instant speed piece of interaction. Hmm. All right, so obviously I'm talking about Wasteland. There are several ways Wasteland lines up with the combo, and it's all about timing. We're going to run through what to do and what not to do here. So wasting first does nothing. You're not going to want to do this. If your opponent has stage and depths in play and you have a Wasteland, if you go to waste one of them, they'll just combo in response, boom, 2020, you're dead. You can slow the combo down. If they go for the combo, you can waste one or the other in response. And they don't get a 2020 right away, but they do still have a land in play, one or the other, whichever one you didn't destroy. So if you left stage in play, all they need to do is draw another Dark Depths or cast a single Life from the Loam, and they're right back in business. You could be facing down the same combo again on the very next turn. And now you don't have a Wasteland. Or you can Galaxy Brain just blow the combo away. This is how you want to interact with this combo. So just let them do it. Let them copy. Let the copy resolve. The Legend Rule. And now when there's only one Dark Depths in play, destroy that one. Sacrificing the Dark Depths itself is part of the conditions of getting a Merit Lage. So you can let it trigger in response to destroy it, and then they have nothing to sacrifice. So then they're down two lands to your one. You used one card to answer two of theirs. They're at least two turns away from presenting the combo again because it's going to take two land drops, and they have to find both pieces again. So that's the way you set them back the most with a Wasteland. you got to be patient. But you also got to watch out for enemy wastelands. If you're in a standoff where they can't make the combo because you waste them, and you can't waste them because they'll make the combo, and they draw a wasteland, they can waste your waste. And then in response, you have to go for it, and then they get to make a 20-20, and there's Merit Lage. Wasteland attack and wasteland protect. So let's talk about how to get a little extra out of Daze and your other soft permission. Daze can dominate early turns of a game, but it loses potency as the game goes on. Wasteland helps keep days relevant in some pretty obvious ways. You know, you destroy their lands, they have less mana, it'll be harder to pay for days. That one's pretty obvious. But here's an extra spicy little trick. So here we are, we got a Delver deck with days in their hand playing against another blue-white control deck. Your savvy blue-white control opponent has correctly identified that you tapped your Volcanic Island on your turn. They're not going to get Spell Pierced, they're not going to get Red Blasted, they, you only have one card in your hand, so it's not Force of Will. The only thing they have to worry about is Days. So they play their fifth land, no worries. Put Jace on the stack, they can pay for Days with that fifth land. If you Days here, they'll just fetch, they'll pay, and they have a Jace. However, if you waste this fetch land, that'll go onto the stack. And then you Days in response to the fetch, you get to kill that Jace. And they'll still get their land, but they don't have Jace, so who cares? The same trick applies to all soft permission. You can cheat an extra mana on your spell pierces and your fluster storms using that same wasteland trick. Note to the savvy control players out there, if they had just fetched first, then they wouldn't have been in this position. Uh, once they have the five mana in play, the wasteland trick doesn't work anymore. So watch out for this on both sides of the table. And that's not the only reason you might want to waste a fetch land. In eternal formats, the top of your deck is frequently a resource. The opponent won't lose a land over this exchange, but they might end up losing something else. So you can wasteland pre or post brainstorm. As we know, the best brainstorms are the ones you line up with a fetch land. You draw your three, you put the stinkers back, then you use your fetch land to shuffle them away, and you're drawing wild and you have a perfect hand. So wasteland can mess that up. You can respond to the brainstorm by hitting the fetch land, and then they draw their three, they put the stinkers back, and they might have to draw the, through those stinkers again. Another thing you can do is wait until the Brainstorm resolves if you think they're going to try to abuse the top of their deck. So there are some cards you want on top of your deck, like Terminus. If they Brainstorm and they put back a card you think might be Terminus, you can Wasteland their fetch, it, and they'll have to decide to lose a land or lose their Terminus. Same thing, if they brainstorm in response to a discard spell, they might be hiding something important to their plan, and you go for the wasteland there, they're going to be stuck. They're, they're either going to lose a land or lose their sweet card, one or the other. And there's other reasons you can make an opponent shuffle. Maybe they scried something at the top, 
maybe they're resolving a predict and you wanna don't want to make let them draw two cards. After a top deck tutor, ooh, I've gotten some serious blowouts in my day when my opponent casts an enlightened tutor, put some important thing on top. Like they, they go for like moat, and then I just they have like three lands and a fetch land, and I just waste the fetch. And it's like, do you wanna crack the fetch? to have four lands in case you draw your moat someday? Or do you want to draw the moat, spend a whole turn hoping that you draw a land later? You can even put cards on top for them. Submerge that Tarmogoyf, waste their fetch. Do you want to lose a land or do you want to lose this threat? You put them in a tough spot. And then Magic is a very tricky game, infinitely tricky. There are lots of reasons you might even want to destroy your own lands. You could save some damage off a of Price of Progress. There's a lot of creatures that care what's in your graveyard, and you can make things different sizes at instant speed by putting Wasteland in your graveyard. You can turn on Revolt. You turn off Landwalk and you know, waste your island, block that merfolk. The game's probably over. Same thing applies to the color hosers. If you don't have a plains, you can't get massacred. You don't have a forest, you can't get submerged. You can destroy a creature land to exile a bridge from below. That's a sweet one. You can destroy lands with enters the battlefield triggers like the Pajuka Bog and then get them back to do it again later. You can speed up a delve. So if you float a mana and then waste the land you just floated mana from, you can exile two cards from your graveyard, the wasteland and the land, plus you have the mana floating. So that's worth three mana on a delve spell compared to just tapping them for two mana. You can also very slowly dig your way out of a back to basics with wasteland. Uh, you wasteland your tapped non-basic then you replay it from the graveyard. The next turn you replay the Wasteland from the graveyard, waste another non-basic, then you play another, that one from the graveyard. So every other turn you can get an untapped land if you have a Crucible of Worlds versus Back to Basics. It's slow, but the Back to Basics matchups tend to be slow. That might be a line out of there. You could even go off with the Gitrog monster. That's more of a commander interaction than legacy, but Nick Fit is a deck. It's wild out there. Anything could happen. Here's where things get extra weird. A wasteland can target itself. The way the magic rules are structured allow this to be possible. So this list here is everything that happens when you cast a spell or activate an ability. These things happen in this order every time. You choose your target up here, but you pay the cost down here. So you announce, I would like to wasteland. The game says, sure, what's your target? I choose this wasteland that's currently still in play. Then you figure out what it's gonna cost for you to do that. Usually it's tap and sacrifice. Then you pay those costs lower down. You pay the cost, you tap it, you sack it, the ability goes on the stack where it promptly fizzles because it has no legal target. Now, why would you wanna waste your own wasteland? Comes in handy for a lot of the same tricks we already talked about. If you wanna turn on revolt, if you have six cards and you only need one more in your graveyard for threshold, if you don't have a land and you need to turn on delirium, if you want to grow a Tarmogoyf, grow a Knight of the Reliquary, and, you, and one point's enough, like that's it. You don't have to spend two lands to turn these on. You can also tap Wasteland for mana. This ability, we haven't talked about it much, but it is not flavor text. This is Wasteland's flavor text, and it's a pretty sweet flavor text at that. But up here, this is real game text. Decks that use Wasteland as a tool will tap it for mana more often than they sacrifice it. We did talk about that. So if your deck has expensive spells, you need to be careful about sacrificing your lands. You can't just, if you're playing Jace the Mind Sculptor, you can't just turn to Wasteland your opponent. That's just not a viable option. Like you gotta, you gotta save that, you gotta build your resources, you have a different plan. Even the Fun Police and Scrapper decks, those smaller decks that are trying to screw their opponent with Wasteland, they should watch their relative resources. When the opponent has five lands and you draw Wasteland, maybe that's not good enough. Like. They already have five. You waste one, they're down to four. They, whatever, they can still cast all their spells. But those decks also have expensive spells in them. Force of Will costs five. And at that point in the game, your soft permission is not good enough. You have to bridge the gap into your hard permission. And hard casting Force of Will happens all the time in Legacy. You just got to identify that Wasteland is there for mana now. We're at that phase of the game. And if it's not good, get it out. There are decks that play few, if any, targets for Wasteland, and others just play a ton of basics to ignore it. Look at this Miracles list. They have 10 fetches and 7 basics. You are not shutting down this deck with a Wasteland. This Burn deck, 
literally no targets. You can't even do any of the shuffle tricks with a fetch land because they just don't even have them. And this storm deck, they have so many basics that they have another one in the sideboard. They can bring in more basics. And they also have ritual effects and artifacts to cheat, a, jump ahead on mana. Like you're not gonna screw this deck with a wasteland either. Oh, some decks are built to blank wasteland and that can be a problem for the wasteland strategy. Like, I mean, if you're built to squeeze mana and they're built not to let their mana get squeezed, you're gonna have a bad time. And if they're not pulling your weight, just board them out, replace them with extra spells. You know, don't worry about your land count. A lot of the time they're not really there to cast spells anyway. Like Wasteland is a spell in a lot of Delver decks. So you'd rather just have four real spells in that spot if Wasteland is not gonna do what you need it to. So that was a lot. We we covered a lot of stuff that this card can do and there's so much more. I didn't even get into any deck specific niche interactions. Like I'm sure an expert lands player, an expert death and taxes player could tell you all sorts of ways to make the game dance around a Wasteland. And we're not even gonna get into that. We also didn't talk about how to play against Wasteland. That's a topic for another day. This card, this unassuming little uncommon from Tempest, just has so much you can say about it. We could spend hours talking about Wasteland, but we don't have hours today. So thanks for watching. Hit the sub button if you haven't yet. Share this, tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter. I love talking about magic there. And check out the Eternal Glory podcast if you like hearing about Legacy. I am a co-host on that podcast, and it's available wherever podcasts are found. And for this episode, special thanks to Eric Virgo and Lawrence Harmon for helping flesh out today's topic. And then thanks to everyone who replied on Twitter when I was looking for cool wasteland tricks to talk about. Uh, again, that's another reason to follow me on Twitter. This topic was suggested by some of my Twitter friends. It was honed by other Twitter people. And the next topic could be picked by you. So come check it out. Once again, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something and I'll see you next time for Wizard School.